It's time for another Dirt Daily, and today's Dirt Daily is about this old Jeep. But before we get to that, this episode is presented by Onyx Off-Road. Onyx Off-Road is a mapping app that you can put on your phone and you can use it to find off-road trails all over America. I've been working with Onyx for about a year now and they keep coming out with new and new features. In fact, coming up in the next couple months, they are gonna have a brand new feature on the map that will not only show you off-road trails that are close by, but also uh, list them in difficulty based on different colors. So like if it's an easy Easy trail might be green and if it's a super extreme trail it could be red and they'll have different colors in between that so that if you are new to off-roading and you just got the app and you just find a trail nearby you might be like eh, maybe I shouldn't go try out this trail that's an extreme red trail with my brand new base model uh, SUV or you might be like, I've been wheeling forever. Uh, I just wanna find some places to go wheeling. And you're like, I want the hard stuff. So you can dive right in. Um, the new, new map is coming out soon. It has a bunch of other cool features. If you don't know what Onyx Off-Road is, you download this app, you can test it out for about a week, and then you can decide if you wanna subscribe. They have different subscription levels. Uh, the, the elite level is the highest level. It's about $100 a year, but not only do you get a bunch of additional features with the Elite program, but you also get discounts with different off-road vendors. So you could literally have the app for free and get discounts on parts that you were gonna buy anyways because you're gonna fix up your old 4x4 or your old Jeep. So let's get to it. This week, uh, I'm gonna talk about this Jeep. I did a video on kind of the history of old Willis and flat fender Jeeps and People seemed to dig it, they wanted more, and I drug this thing home and I was like, well, let's dive into it. Let's, I, I love working on the old Jeeps. They're fun to work on, they're super basic. And I'm gonna do a little bit of a walk around today, kind of showcase what this is, what problems it has, and maybe we'll even get it to a point where we can get it rolling. I don't think it's gonna be running by the end of the today, but right now the thing won't even move back and forth, and hopefully I can get it to a rolling status before we get it to running status. Let's get to work. So this Jeep is a 1946 Willis CJ2A. Um, I will call it Willis, I will call it Willys, I will call it Willis, Willys, Wells, Wells, whatever. Um, I, I don't really care how you pronounce it. I don't get caught up in semantics. If you get angry that I call it Willis instead of Willys or Willys instead of Willis, I'm sorry. I want you to know that the shop's a safe place for you to call the Jeep whatever you want to call it. Kind of surprised I even need to say that. All right, but enough about that. I know this is a 1946 CJ2A because on the outside of the frame behind the bumper on the driver's front, there's a little tiny tag. And also under the hood on the passenger side firewall, there are two tags and those have the VIN on it, which is the vehicle identification number. Some people call them the VIN number, which is not really right either. But again, I'm not gonna worry about semantics. Um, it has the VIN numbers on both spots. You can take those numbers, get on the internet, World Wide Web, look them up, and it'll tell you what year it is. Um, I don't remember the exact website, just search how to identify Willie's VIN number year, get something on the Google, and it'll tell you. Um, and you search it, and I figured out this is a 1946, which is pretty cool. That's an early one. Um, and in addition to that, what I was excited about this Jeep was that it has the original engine. So I was excited about this Jeep because it has what I believe is the original engine, or at least the original style engine. This is the Go Devil four-cylinder engine. It's a 134 cubic inch engine. Um, it's known as the L head. It's a flathead engine, has all the valves in the block and not in the head. Uh, and I think this is probably the stock engine. There is a serial number on the block uh, behind the water pump. It's not on the head. There's like a little surface that has some numbers stamped in it. Those are not the same numbers as the VIN, but, uh, and I don't think they are supposed to match. They're just different numbers, but I believe this is probably, there's probably a way to figure out if those numbers match this, um, or at least if those numbers correlate with what this Jeep should have had. However, those numbers are, you can hardly read them. You can only see about one or two of them. I cleaned all the VIN 
and other numbers off with some brake clean and a little scotch brake pad. So you want to be careful with them because you don't want to scrape away too much of the material. But somebody had painted this thing, this sort of army, it's not army green, it's more of an oregano green. Uh, this was actually a red Jeep. You can tell by the spots on the firewall where the green paint has kind of flaked off. Though I'm not really too concerned about that. I'm not looking to make it pretty. I just kind of want to get it back up and running. So um, I was excited for this one because it has this engine. I don't know if this engine's any good. I don't know if this engine turns and that is something that we'll have to get to eventually. Inside the tub of the Jeep is actually pretty solid. The floorboards, uh, they have a little surface rust, but they're pretty solid. The transfer case um, and transmission shifters are all look like they have the original knobs on. They have the original uh, covers that go over them. The toolbox opens and the floor is not completely rotted out. Though there, there is some dirt down in here. The fuel tank, um, someone has started to remove it and I will probably continue to remove the fuel tank for two reasons. One, there's a bunch of dirt. In fact, there's grass growing under the gas tank. And I wanna clean all that dirt and grass out from under there and try to keep moisture from getting caught underneath the fuel tank for now so that it doesn't rust. Also, I wanna take the fuel tank out and kind of inspect it on the inside with a flashlight, see if it's all rotted out, maybe put some fuel in it and see if it leaks out. And if it's good, um, it's missing the gas cap. So I'll probably run it down to my local auto parts store, take the whole tank with me and just see if I can find a gas tank or a gas cap that will screw on it. Uh, the fuel sending unit on the top is missing. Somebody just made a plate and drilled some holes and put some little brass screws in to hold it in place and it looks like they just siliconed it down. I should probably put a fuel gauge in it someday, but if it's not leaking, I'll probably just make sure all the screws are sealed up and just leave it as is for now. You can check the gas in these pretty easily by just reaching out from the driver's seat, uh, taking the gas cap off and putting a stick down in the gas tank and seeing if there's enough fuel in it. Um, that's the other thing. There's no seats in this right now. There's a bracket on the uh, passenger side where a seat would slip in and then fold up so you can access this little toolbox. There's no seat on the driver's side, but it, it was usually just bolted right to the floor. Uh, there's a couple different options. You can go to the factory seat brackets. You can order them aftermarket from Amex Ada. You can try and track down a set of seat frames out of another Jeep, uh, or you could just come up with your own seats or seat brackets. In the past, I've used everything from hot rod seats to forklift seats, the aftermarket suspension seats. It's kind of hard, especially if you're a tall guy, to fit a seat in that you can um, be stuffed back against the fenders enough so that you have enough leg room. But uh, I think for this one, I'm gonna try and go back to the stock style seats and maybe just get the brackets and put them in and just go back to factory style cushions and everything. I'm not looking to hot rod this one. I've done that in the past. In fact, that brings up a whole nother thing about flat fenders. Come here, buddy. Ugh. From 1941 until about 1968, they made over a million flat fenders of all the different makes and models. Uh, Ford, Willis, Bantam, uh, MBs, GPWs, CJ2As, CJ3As, CJ3Bs. So all of the different styles. Uh, one, I think it's over 1.1 million. And that's just from a quick search on the internet. So there could be more than that. That's how many they made. Now, a lot of those are gone. They're destroyed. They either got blown up in the war or they got rusted away on being used on a farm or whatever. But 1.1 million vehicles is a lot. So that brings me to the whole, what do you do with a Jeep? And I have over the years, messed around with flat fenders. I don't think I am a flat fender expert in any way, but I like them and I've messed around with a bunch of them. And I have a little bit of advice to somebody that is a new to the flat fender uh, niche. Number one, if you come across one that has the original engine in it and the original drivetrain, don't just pull it out and throw that stuff away so that you can put an LS in it. Um, try to get it running and see if it will run and drive the way it is. 
you'll have a lot of fun, you'll learn a lot, and uh, you'll end up with a vehicle that's actually getting kind of rare because even though they made 1.1 million of them, uh, it seems like at least half of the ones that you find nowadays, someone has done an engine swap in, uh, whether it's to the later F-head engine or to the tried and true Buick V6, like my old blue Jeep. That is, even though it's white Jeep, it's, I call it old blue. Um, that one has a Buick V6 in it. Uh, or they put some other engine in it. My The very first flat finner I ever got, uh, Grampy, that came with a 327 Chevy engine in it. And... I pulled that out thinking I was gonna make it so much better and it turned into a project that I've never finished. So that's the other reason why you don't just instantly blow the thing apart and take all the parts and sell them off on some flat fender collector's page because uh, it's a much bigger project. I have my garden Jeep flat fender, which I, it was kind of the same thing. I drug it home, it was semi, original and i was like oh i'll just pull the engine have the engine rebuilt and i'll pull the axles and hit, i'll pull the frame and fix that and it's like the next thing you know it's a pile of parts so uh like any project but especially with these flat fenders if you mess around with them a little bit and you get them running in the stock form you might actually really enjoy it before you um, feel like you have to put lockers in it and rock sliders and a winch and all these things that we like to do to our vehicles, uh, maybe try and enjoy it first. Or if you know that you wanna do all that stuff, uh, there's a couple other options. Like my GPW doesn't even have a factory tub. It has like some aftermarket tub and you could start with that and you can build whatever wazoo, all the crazy trail rig out of a tub that's rust free. And maybe you could even build your own frame and then you can put whatever crazy suspension that thing's on links and airbags. Uh, you can build them into whatever you want. So I think the point of my story is if you find one that's stock and original, maybe try and keep it stock and original, at least until you get it running and driving or uh, find somebody that wants a stock original one if you know that you want to do an engine swap or an LS and tons and all that happy malarkey. Um, so I say that out of experience because I've gone down that route before where I thought, oh, I can just easily turn this into like super crazy trail rig and it turns into a huge project. So, uh, and I think there's something cool about the stock ones. The same way that there's something cool about a modified flat fender or any modified Jeep, there's something cool about a stocker, especially now that it's been 80 years plus since they first made them. And the stock ones, the ones with the stock drivetrain are getting harder and harder to find. Uh, it's almost ironic how you can make 1.1 million of something and more people seem to have pulled that engine out and put in a V6 or a V8 than actually left that engine in. Which might be telling that that engine's really not very impressive. But um, I have a lot of buddies nowadays, like there's a whole uh, group of guys that are getting into this Go Devil thing and they are stoked to have the Go Devil engine in their Jeep. I th That's the other thing, I don't fall into any one camp. I like the Go Devil stock stuff. I like the crazy Jeep with the V8. I like the like old Buick V6s. I like the new V6s. I think there's, with 1.1 million Jeeps, you can do just about anything with your Jeep. And it's your Jeep, do whatever you want with it. But my advice would be if you find a stocker, either leave it stock until you get it running and driving and realize it's not what you want, or trade it off to somebody that wants a stock one and get one that is uh, just a tub for the look and feel of the flat fender and then you can put whatever late model uh, aftermarket stuff in it. Because there's so many cool things that people have done to it. There's like fuel injection for these old engines now. I think there's a guy that's working with Holly for their sniper kit and they put fuel injection on the Go Devil. Bye Baxter. Um, or there's, well there's everything. I mean old Rick Payway, he put a Buick 455 in his flat fender, his GPW, and that thing was one of the icons. I remember when I was in high school, I read about a flat fender that was, we actually featured it on Dirt Every Day a long time ago, it was called the Ugly Jeep, and Jimmy Nyland built it. He was an old magazine writer, and he put a, a Range Rover 215 in it, an aluminum block V8, which is, 
uh, I think it's a spin-off of the Buick aluminum block V8. And I thought that was really cool back in the day. So I think also as you are around them more, uh, they become cooler in different ways. Like maybe when you're younger, you're like, I don't want that old four cylinder. I want like a cool late model, lightweight, powerful engine. And then as you get older, you're like, meh, I just want to bebop around. Like my, like I think what would be really cool to do with this Jeep someday is take it out to the desert and drive it through the sand, uh, like at night with the windshield down and a full moon. But uh, I'm kind of getting off on a tirade and my dog's barking. So I'm gonna go see what the dog's barking at and then we're gonna come back and figure out, uh, I'm gonna show you some more things about this flat fender. What's wrong, buddy? Apparently he was barking at nothing. Uh, what else can I tell you about this Jeep? The rear fenders are kind of beat up. Uh, the bed of these Jeeps get beat up uh, because these Jeeps were originally sold to be used by like farmers, uh, ranchers, and they weren't used the way like nowadays you'd be like, oh, just put your cooler back there. No, they were used where they were like, pick all these rocks up out of this field and they would just th pile them in here or take this down out in the woods and bring us back a couple Jeep loads of firewood. The stuff was just thrown in. They were a tool, they were a pickup truck. Um, there's a tailgate. Now, some of these tailgates do have a number stamped on the side of the tailgate here. I don't think that is a VIN. I think that is a serial, but there's a number there and there's also a number on sort of like the front support bracket uh, underneath inside the engine bay here. The, there's a support bracket that is right in front of the pedals and there's a number stamped in that. Uh, this Jeep is, has all of the gauges except the speedometer. Um, it does still have the parking brake lever, which is pretty cool. The parking brake on these is actually uh, a drum brake on the back of the transfer case. So when you set the parking brake, it holds the transfer case from spinning, which then holds the rear end from turning. So, uh, which is kind of brings up another problem with this Jeep. When I picked this Jeep up, uh, the guy that was getting rid of it said, I think the engine's locked up and I think the rear end is locked up. And I was kind of bummed about that because I really, I was kind of hoping this wouldn't be an enormous project. I was hoping it would be kind of a moderate project. But I figured out one thing right off the bat is I was winching it onto the trailer and the rear end is not locked up. It's actually, the tires are spinning in the opposite direction. So this probably most likely has an open differential. So it has spider gears in there. And if you've ever jacked up a vehicle and spun the tires with an open differential, they will spin the opposite direction. If you turn one tire, the other tire will turn the opposite direction. Now, when I'm winching this on and it's doing that, it's literally one tire is going forward and the other tire, even if the Jeep is being drugged forward, the other tire is turning backwards. That tells me that something is, there's a couple situations. The ring and pinion in the rear axle is locked up. Uh, the parking brake is stuck. The transmission or transfer case is stuck. And so the drive shaft and the pinion are not turning. So that's one of the things that I wanna dive into. Why is that not turning? Um, I think in order to do that, we'll probably put it on the lift and pull the drive shaft and see if the pinion turns. If the pinion turns, that's good. That means the axle's probably okay. We can probably blow the diff cover off and check the oil anyways to see if there's oil in it or if it's mostly mud and water from the last 80 years. Um, which that brings up, where did it come from? I was told this Jeep was used on a vineyard and or a ranch somewhere in central to northern California. So uh, that's what I was told. I haven't actually verified that yet, but that would be part of the reason why it's all kind of beat up. Here's another thing that's kind of cool. Uh, CJ2A only has one tail light. It has these reflectors or people put these reflectors on, but it only has one tail light. It doesn't have tail lights side to side. Um, this one has kind of a patch panel in here of mid metal that was screwed in. I don't know why that was there. I don't think there's like a hole behind it. Um, uh, yeah, actually there is a hole behind it. So somebody cut a hole in it and then they decided to patch that. 
So that's the other thing. You never know with these things. Like they could have so many centuries of patina and stories and cobbled together little parts. And I used to think, uh, you gotta get, get it back to original. And now I'm like, eh, that's kind of cool. That's just kind of part of the story. So um, I'm not really looking to make this one a Barrett Jackson uh, Pebble Beach concourse vehicle. I just want to keep it looking kind of like it came off the farm, but get it back to a point where I can drive it around. Here's another thing. Um, there's like these chains that are used to attach the tailgate. Um, they not only latch it closed, but then when you open the tailgate, uh, you can hook them in this and it'll work as kind of like a little platform. And then this one has like a second hook, which is kind of weird. Um, maybe that is so that you can have it kind of partially open so stuff doesn't fall out. Um, I don't think these are the original chains. They might be, but I think the original chains kind of have like a funky shaped hook, but you never know. They might be original chains. This one has like holes in the tailgate, but it, I think it's an original tailgate because it does have Willis. It has these little uh, tie down points across here, which would have gone to a soft top. And then these brackets on the side would have held the bows of the soft top. So like in the summertime, when you don't want the top on, you could take them off and mount, set the, the bows in here. I think these corner parts are also for the soft top. Um, and then up here on the windshield, it's kind of cool. They have like an old gun rack there and then a bunch of switches and knobs and buttons, which I don't think they are original, but we'll climb underneath the dash in the future and figure out how to make that stuff work. Today, we just want to get it to roll back and forth, which because that rear end is not working, um, we got to figure that out first. Oh, and one other thing. So this Jeep has 16 inch wheels on it all the way around. And it has, uh, they're old tires that have inner tubes in it. Three of them are kind of holding air. This front driver's one is not holding air. So I'm probably going to swap out the tires and wheels, which isn't really a problem because I have these. Uh, these are pretty cool. They are just some 16 inch wheels that you can order from Amex Ada, uh, which makes a bunch of repop versions of the old stuff. And the tires um, are some old Firestones that you can get from Coker Tire. Uh, I believe these are a 650, 16, yeah. So uh, this one's definitely taller than the front one that's on there, but it's about the same as the rear. And so my plan is, to replace all the tires right off the bat with those. Uh, mostly because then I know I have tires that will hold air and if I'm pushing it around or winching it around or whatever, dragging it, they're not gonna be just digging into the ground. Um, I, do, I do like the old tires. I'm not gonna get rid of them or the old wheels, but I'm, for now I'm gonna put these bright orange wheels on uh, so it has nice rolling stock, which we isn't really that unusual because if you know me, uh, the, the, my two favorite colors for vehicles is kind of an army green, olive, uh, pistachio type color and orange. So I think it's perfect that this is gonna have orange wheels and tires. Um, another thing about them, you're gonna wanna spray all these lug nuts with some WD-40 or some sort of penetrating oil so that they can break loose. And the driver's side lug nuts are often left-hand thread. So what does that mean? Well. Um, for most of you, this is pretty obvious, but for some of you, most nuts and bolts are righty tighty. So as you turn the top of the bolt to the right, it gets tighter. And as you turn it to the top of the bolt to the left, it gets looser. So those are right hand threaded bolts, righty tighty, lefty loosey. Now on early Jeeps um, and a lot of early vehicles, they had this idea that if you had a right hand thread bolt on the left side or driver's side of the vehicle, it might actually work loose going down the road. Um, we have since learned that that's not really the case, but that there was a time. So, uh, and if you look really close on these wheel studs, you can actually see an L. And that means that these are left-hand thread. So that means that they go lefty-tighty, righty-loosey.
So spray all these down, um, put a breaker bar or a ratchet on and slowly turn it to the left and you will, it won't come off. Slowly turn it to the right and it should work loose. So uh, just so that you don't grab your impact, set it to a gazillion foot pounds of torque and put it on there and be like, why are these not getting loose? And then you snap these old 80 year old wheel studs off. Spray everything down first. That's what my dad said. So on this front of this Jeep, there is an old tow bar. This tow bar does not have the type of hitch that would attach to a trailer ball. It has a hitch that looks like it was used to be towed behind a tractor, like it would have a tractor pin going down through it. I'm probably going to remove this because A, I don't have a tractor, which is kind of unfortunate. I should get a tractor. And B, uh, having a tow bar on this Jeep kind of hides that cool seven slot grill that I love so much. Um, C, uh, there's another problem right inside here. I'll grab my flashlight to show it to you. Um, the frame has a big old crack in it. It's not even a crack, it's broken. Uh, there's the bumper and a cross member and the tub are all kind of holding it together, but that is a big old crack in the front of the frame, which these flat fender early Jeeps are notorious for having cracked frames, especially up in that area. And part of that is probably because somebody was dragging it around with a tractor that didn't really care that it was back there. You imagine some big tractor, a little Jeep, and they drag it through a ditch or around a tree or over a boulder and something gets wonky and then the next thing you know, the frame is busted. Or um, who knows like what farmer was, like there's some definitely some wacky business going up here with like this almost half inch plate welded to the frame, some sort of weird little receiver dingus um, and the trailer hitch. So you don't know what they had hanging off the front of this. Plus, I mean, they're Jeeps and they're getting used and they get beat up a lot. So you never know what would have caused that to be broken. At some point, um, I'm gonna have to fix that. I'm gonna have to address that problem. And I kind of was debating, well, should I just fix that first? And my buddy was like, why don't you see if the engine will turn by hand and the drivetrain will turn and everything? Because then you might decide that uh, if it doesn't turn, then you could pull the engine out and it would make it that much easier to fix. If the engine does turn and everything is kind of copacetic in the engine, then you maybe just remove the fender and the tire and that shock, and then you can get down in there and fix it. So, uh, good advice from my buddy Frank, which is unusual because Frank usually just spouts off a bunch of randomness. Uh, all right, uh, I think we're gonna start with putting tires and wheels on this thing, at least on the front, so that I can roll it and then figure out why the rear is not rolling at all. Oh, I got one more thing I need to show you because I think it's kind of cool. Um, on the front frame rails are some torch cut, looks like 5 8 inch plate recovery points that are welded to the frame. Um, Super butch, probably not the best thing to yank this Jeep out of a mud hole with, but I cannot remove those. Those are so cool looking. And down here on the shackle between the leaf spring and the frame, you can see a block of wood that has been wedged in there to kind of keep the suspension from moving. This Jeep has one of those in every corner. Like every single shackle has a block of wood wedged in it or wire tied into it so that the suspension doesn't want to move. Why? Uh, maybe the shackle bushings are blown out. Maybe they want it to kind of help lift it a little bit. Who knows? Uh, that's another thing we will dive into as we get down further on the to-do list of this Jeep. But first, tires. This may be pretty obvious to a lot of us, but um, if you're a kid and you've never changed a tire before and you're doing it with a wrench, a breaker bar, you don't need to lift the vehicle off the ground before you get the lug nuts loose. So like, just leave it on the ground. That'll help keep the wheel from spinning. Put the lug, nut, lug wrench on it, crank it, get them all loose, and then jack the truck up or Jeep and then take the lug nuts the rest of the way off. Uh, 
because I'm using this impact, uh, I can just put the thing up and not worry about it. Now, there's a couple other things that when you have an old vehicle like this and you jack the wheels and tires up to change the tires, grab the top and bottom of the, wheel, the tire and see if there's movement. That's you're basically checking to see if the hub is moving on the spindle, which might tell you that the bearings need replaced, rebuilt, um, maybe they're loose, maybe they're worn out. Uh, you might be able to refurbish them or you might need to redo, repack the wheel bearings. So this one doesn't seem to have very much, if any movement. It's kind of hard to tell because the tire is flat. And so the movement that I'm seeing may just be in the tire. Uh, I think there's a little bit of slop in there. So that'll be something I'll have to dive into. Also, remember, this is the driver's side. This has the left-hand threads. So you're going to want to turn it right um, clockwise to get the lug nuts off. Oh. Another thing is uh, these locking hubs. These are kind of neat. So these are some old locking hubs. And this type of locking hub is like, if you've ever had a vehicle with locking hubs, you basically can engage or disengage the hub, which then engages the tire and wheel to the axle shaft. Uh, Warren has been known for making locking hubs forever. This is like, here's an old set of Warren hubs and they would normally have a cover on it that would have a free and a lock setting. And you basically would turn that one way or the other. Nowadays, most vehicles just have a unit bearing. So you don't have to get out and lock and unlock your hubs. Uh, the reason that these were installed back in the day were to keep the front end from spinning. When you're driving down the road, you'd put these on, you could unlock it. It'd be, one le it'd be less stuff turning, uh, less wear and tear on drive shafts, a little bit better fuel economy, which, I mean, I don't really know that that was a concern or as much of a concern. But um, these, when I turn the wheel, I'm getting a bunch of drag. That tells me that the hubs are locked. And also, if I look inside there, I can probably see the drive shaft spinning. So I'm gonna unlock these hubs. First of all, let's clean them up a little bit. That can's just about dead. Put a little bit of spray on there. Wipe them down. Grab a little wire brush. Um, and then we can kind of see how they work. So this hub, there's two bars, kind of metal plates. Um, and right on the side of it, it says lock. You can just see in the white paint, O-C-K. Um, there's an L under there. Uh, so each of these say lock. And what you wanna do is this will pivot out. You can see this kind of piece has like a slot in it. Well, there's kind of a pin and this bar will pivot up and out, both of them, and then turn and then lay back down. And the other side will probably say unlock. So we'll grab a little pry bar. And there you can see how one of them pivots up and then pivots around and goes back in. And then on this side, it says free. And then we do the same with this one. Bring that up, bring that around, and then that goes back down. And this one also says free. I think while we have it up, We'll get in there, clean it up a bit. Got to a little brush. Wipe it all down. Sit in the free side. And then even come in with a little baby hammer and give it a little tap. And now this hub is unlocked. We'll do the same thing on the other side. And then it'll be that much easier to move this Jeep around with the hubs unlocked. So in case you don't know, when you want to go in four wheel drive, you put that to lock, then the hub is locked to the axle shaft 
and the hub is also a lock to the tire and wheel, and then you have four-wheel drive. Um, if, if you unlock both hubs and you put it in four-wheel drive, it'll send power to the front differential and it'll send power out and turn the axle shafts, but it won't actually be connecting between this hub and the tire and wheel, so you won't actually have four-wheel drive. Also, sometimes these hubs, um, they're old, they get all gunked up, full of mud and grease, old grease, and dirt and garbage. Um, so we did that and hopefully it's all unlocked in there. These, when you redo the hubs, when you repack your wheel bearings, you'll probably pull these out, clean those all up and rebuild those as well. I don't know the specific brand that this one is. I've seen them before, but I can't remember the brand. Uh, but there used to be a lot of different companies that would make locking hubs like this for old Willys Jeeps. Before that, you didn't have a hub. You had what was known as a drive flange or a drive slug. And it was just a plate that bolted on to the hub and had splines cut in it and it would just bolt on uh, and your axle was always ready to be in four wheel drive. Uh, the front end was always spinning, but only when you engage four wheel drive did it actually can send power out through all of this. So now the hub's unlocked. Uh, I'm gonna finish taking the tires and wheels off and get ready to put the new ones on. That was neat. That was exactly not what I wanted to do. So I soaked this thing. I let it sit for a while. I used a proper six point socket. Um, I got it on there. I turned it right, which should be loose instead of tight. And the lug nut spun. It didn't spin on the stud, all of the uh, ears of the lug nut smeared over. So that tells me one of two things. Uh, basically it didn't come off, it ruined the lug nut. And that tells me one of two things. Um, either this thing is so old and rusty that it doesn't want to break loose, or B, one wheel stud on this hub uh, is not a left-hand thread. It might be a right-hand thread, which is another thing to look at. Like maybe over the years, maybe they broke a wheel stud and they were like, well, just replace it with whatever you can get at the local farm tractor supply store. And this uh, is not an actual left-hand or this is not an actual right-hand thread. It's a, or this is not an actual left-hand thread. It's a right-hand thread. So first thing I'm gonna do is try and clean it some more and see if there is actually an L on this stud, which is kind of hard to tell. It sure looks like there's one on there. So, uh Two of the lug nuts came right off. One of them, it completely smeared over uh, the ears of it. The second, the next one started to smear over the ears and I stopped. And the last one I haven't even touched yet. I am going to get out the torch and heat these up, get them good and hot, and then see if I can either grab them with some vice grips or maybe hammer on a smaller socket and back those off. Um, I'm not too concerned about heat uh, this is just, as long as I don't ruin them completely, I should be good to go. I have two lug nuts, so I can always bolt a tire on just to move it around, but I'm probably going to have to, hopefully I don't have to screw up, hopefully I don't screw up the threads on these three wheel studs and I can just put new uh, left hand uh, lug nuts back on when I go to put the tire, the new tire on. This is just one of those things that happens every time you work on an old truck. You're just like, oh, this should go easy. This is kind of par for the course. Whenever you work on an old rusty truck, 
I was kind of hoping I would get lucky seeing as it's from California, but you know, it doesn't always work out. We're gonna come in here and just try to heat that guy up. Nice and hot. All right. See if another one will come off. That's pretty good. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hot. That's pretty good. Now, this last one, I kind of boogered it up. So what I found was a 19 millimeter uh, socket. We're gonna see if there's enough left that it can grab onto that. And we got it. <laughs> that was lucky. I think all of our, hey, spider. That spider's probably like, my house just got really hot and then disappeared. Um, so, good news is we didn't damage the wheel studs. Um, I'm not sure that most of these lug nuts, these were the first two I took off. I think we can reuse those, but uh, probably going to run to the store and get some new lug nuts for at least this wheel and maybe the other corner as well. <laughs> Old trucks are fun. Um, you can get really frustrated really fast or you can just deal with it and then the thing will be back up and running. This thing doesn't spin as easily as I thought it would, but it might be the drums are just kind of tight or might, the drums might be full of mud. Start with a little anti-seize on the wheel studs so that hopefully the next time we try to take these off, they don't smear over and get ruined. And then roll this new tire in here. Slide that guy on there. Oh wow, there's, a, there's another issue. Is this locking hub is so big around that it almost doesn't fit in the wheel. Cleared that old paint off. That got it. Oh, it wants to go. Come on. These wheels were powder coated and somebody spray painted these old hubs and the outside edge of this hub steps down to the inside edge of the hub which steps down to the very inside edge of the hub. So there's a chance that we might need to get forceful to get it on there. Kind of looks like if it gets past the first section. And here's a little die grinder. Just kind of All right, let's see if this will go on now. like you might need to take this hub off completely 
in order to get the wheel and tire on, which is kind of dumb. That tells me that the um, center bore of these wheels is just a little bit too tight. So I think I'm gonna get on here on the wheel with this little die grinder. Maybe I just have powder coat build up. <laughs> kind of dumb. It's kind of like this outside edge of the hub is just a little bit larger diameter than the next section and then the inside is no problem at all. So um, I'm going to put one lug nut on here. And then maybe we run to town and try to get some more left-hand lug nuts. Right, more left-hand lug nuts. That was annoying. That's how it goes sometimes. All you wanna do is change a tire. The lug nuts smear off. Gotta heat them up. Tire comes off, new tire and wheel doesn't fit. Got to massage the hub, got to massage the wheel. Everything goes back together. And then now you need to go find more parts because you messed up parts. Jeeping. All right. The, I got the wheel on, I ran to my Napa and got some new lug nuts. 641-2025 uh, is the part number. Uh, I got 10 of them so I can replace all of them on the driver's side of the Jeep. Uh, I also stepped up a little bit. I think the old lug nuts were three quarter and these use a 13 16 socket. So the bolt or the nut is just a little bit bigger. Um, the holes in these wheels and the original wheels are kind of wallowed out a little bit. The original ones, because they're old, the new ones, I don't know why, maybe, uh, I think we ran these wheels across the Rubicon and maybe they got loosened up and wallowed just a little bit. So feel better about having a little bit bigger lug nut. But uh, look at that, looks great. Uh, this hub situation where the wheel barely fits over the hub, uh, I don't know if this hub needs to come off and get turned down or if the wheels need to be opened up a little bit but I got it on there and I'll probably have to do the same thing on the other side where I kind of polish the outside of the hub polish the inside of the rim just a little bit but one's on I'm going to do all the other ones and then we're going to try and figure out why that rear axle pinion situation is not spinning um, yeah just chugging along uh, new tires. I think they look great. Look at that. Sporty. Sporty old Jeep. What do you think? It definitely pops with the new tires and wheels. All the other tires changed no problem. There were no lug nut issues. I replaced all the lug nuts on the driver's side. Uh, the passenger side, I just reused the lug nuts, though I will probably change those out so that they all are the larger lug nuts. Um, I definitely think the color makes it more fun. It kind of was subtle and kind of army looking before with the black wheels. I think the orange wheels really pop. I like the black wheels, but I need to get some better tires on them for if I'm gonna reuse those wheels. So what's up next is I'm going to try and get this thing on the lift. Uh, the rear end is not turning, it is not rolling. So I'm gonna have to put a floor jack under it, jack it up, and then try to push, pull, drag it back to the lift. I wanna figure out why that rear end's not turning. Uh, if the transmission and the transfer case are in gear, that would keep it from turning, but I have the transmission in neutral, and I believe the transfer case in neutral. The transfer case has two shifters. Uh, the one 
is high, neutral, and low. That's the one on the passenger side. And then the one on the driver's side just engages or disengages the front axle. So I believe the transfer case shifter on the passenger side is in the middle in neutral. And I know that the transmission is in neutral, but whether or not the shifters are doing what they're supposed to be doing inside the gearboxes could be what's causing this. Also, uh, if the rear pinion is bound up with the ring gear somehow, that could also be pro causing this problem. So what I'm gonna do is put it on a lift and then disconnect the drive shaft and see which of those is not turning. Is it the transfer case output not turning or the pinion not turning? And then we can determine what we have to fix. All right, let's get this thing on the lift. Nothing slows down a rolling floor jack quicker than like a little nut or rock or something on the floor of the shop. So I'm gonna sweep up and get everything like this one right there. There it is. See that little guy right there? That's the nut that would stop all progress. I'm gonna sweep all this stuff up and have a clear runway. So this Jeep has an offset rear diff, which means the differential is not in the center of the axle tube. It's actually offset to the passenger side, which is great when you're off-roading because both the drivers or the both the front axle differential and the rear differential are in a line. So if you're driving down the trail and you see a rock, you're like, well, I just need to keep both diffs away from that. So maybe you'd move over a little so that you can run the rock underneath the side of the Jeep that doesn't have a diff. What that means though, is if you jack up the rear diff, uh, the axle is gonna come up at an angle and it may not lift the tires evenly. So I'm gonna put two floor jacks under it, try to get the, foot, the rear end up off the ground, and then I can work those floor jacks and push and pull and get the thing back here into the lift. I have these really nice little caster things that you can set a car on and just set it on under, put one under each wheel and roll it around. Fortunately, my Porsche, the project that I haven't touched in a while, uh, is sitting on those. So rather than pull it out and swap it around, I'm gonna just do it this way. Give it the cautionary shake. Pretty good. All right, Jeep's up in the lift. Let's get underneath there and figure out what type of problems we have. Actually, dad always said, don't call it problems, call it opportunities. So let's go underneath here and see what type of opportunities this Jeep has hiding. I know I'm trying to figure out why the rear end's not turning, but I'm gonna start by just walking back through everything. Here are these pieces of wood that are wedged into each shackle. Uh, I don't really know what that's for. Um, it's probably because these shackles are old and really worn out, but I'm gonna start by just removing these because I don't really think I need them, but I'm gonna keep them because uh, maybe they're important. I'll set those over there. Now, the next thing, if you, the front end, the front steering on these early flat fenders or all the flat fenders is pretty convoluted. Uh, the steering column comes down to a steering gearbox, which is way back underneath the engine or beside the engine. And then there's a drag link. It goes to a pitman arm to a drag link, which comes right here. And then this pitman arm pivots a bell crank, which is attached to a cross member on the frame, and then that runs out to uh, these two tie rods. Now, if you wiggle the tires back and forth, 
uh, you can see a lot of movement here in the end of that drag link. Also, you can, I can kind of see some movement in the bell crank. Um, some point, somebody put a steering stabilizer on here, which I'm not usually a big fan of steering stabilizers. I'm pretty sure this steering stabilizer was put on because all this other stuff was worn out. Uh, so that'll probably come off someday. Not right now. Uh, the rest of the Jeep, pretty crusty and rusty. There's like a bunch of goo and grease and everything wedged onto this front axle. The front axle on this should be a Dana 25, and I believe the rear is a Dana 41. And CJ2As, I believe, came with 538s. I think that was the only option. I think the military ones had a different ratio, but the uh, civilians were all 538. Uh, everything on the driver's side looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a repair here, but everything looks pretty tight. Over here on the passenger side is where the frame is broken. And it's bad, but I don't think it would be impossible to repair. So uh, maybe not today, definitely not today, but you know, that's one of those things you look at and you're like, okay, how are we gonna do this? I think if the frame is kind of jacked and aligned up and then everything is cleaned up really good and welded back together and then would probably plate it. Maybe something would run across the bottom and the top and another piece on the side and then maybe even a gusset on the inside because it's actually right behind a cross member. So I don't think that would be an impossible repair and probably pretty important down the road. But that's not what we're looking at today. Let's go back here to this rear axle. Oh, there's the exhaust. That's pretty hodgepodge and patched. Transmission and transfer case, very greasy. Right up here is the transfer case. This is the Spicer 18 transfer case. It is an offset transfer case, so both the front and rear outputs are offset to the passenger side. Uh, I kind of mentioned that before, that way your drive shafts stay in line. Um, it's pretty nice, this Jeep has skid plates underneath both the engine and transmission transfer case. Uh, the transmission should be a T90, which is just a little three speed. And right here on the back of the transfer case, there's a little tiny plate and you can remove this plate and replace it with either a PTO or an overdrive or one of both. You can actually put a PTO and overdrive system on this transfer case. Um, this part right here, this big ring is the parking brake. So there's usually a, a lever, a cable that runs to this little lever right here. And that lever goes up to the arm that you pull in the dash and that will engage the parking brake. I can move this arm freely and I can actually see the drums uh, or the shoes pushing up against the drum. So that kind of tells me that the parking brake is not the problem. Uh, this drive shaft, however, does not want to turn. So that means I need to remove the drive shaft and then we'll figure out, is it the pinion that's holding everything up or is it the transfer case and transmission that's holding everything up? So this is the Dana 41 rear axle. It's offset to the passenger side. And you can see as I turn the tires, the opposite tire turns the opposite direction. That means that the axle shafts are coming in and they're turning the spider gears, but they're actually just forcing the other spider gear to turn the other direction. Um, that's not unusual, but what's unusual is that the pinion itself is not turning. So if I grab the pinion and try to turn it, nothing happens. So I'm going to come in here and disconnect the drive shaft from these two U-bolts, and then I can see if the pinion will turn. Hopefully, well, it's not really, it's gonna be one or the other. It's either gonna be probably some work to a rear end or probably some work to a transfer case. Maybe something is just kind of caught up inside there, but we're gonna start with removing the drive shaft and see if the rear end will turn without the drive shaft connected. There's another step to all of this that I didn't do that I usually suggest um, where 
if you have the opportunity before you get underneath the Jeep or an old truck or whatever old project vehicle you're working on and start taking it apart, uh, pressure wash it. I like to use that gunk uh, engine degreaser, spray it all over. This thing's got a bunch of mud and stuff. It's funny because like there's mud and grease and then when they painted the Jeep, they painted over all of that. I guess it's not really funny because farm Jeep, um, but uh, yeah, if you pressure wash it, it'll make it that much nicer. Um, spray it down a bunch with some engine degreaser and try to pressure wash it. Like these transfer case, very, very greasy. Uh, the axle itself has a lot of junk on it. But you know what? For right now, I'm just gonna get this drive shaft off and then we'll figure out the next, figure out how we can fix it. There it goes. It really did not want to come out of there. All right, there we go. So here's our moment of truth. Drive shaft is removed. Will the pinion turn or will the drive shaft turn? Ooh, ooh. So the pinion is now turning. It doesn't sound good, but it is turning. So, <laughs> something in the gearbox situation is holding us up. Which is neither good nor bad. We knew that something wasn't happy. Um, we now know that the axle uh, is probably not the problem. I should probably still open the rear diff, clean out the housing, see if there's any chunks of metal or junk down in there. But um, that means that I'm going to need to dive into the transfer case. Uh, probably drop the skid plate and there should be like a little access panel. So that's going to be for a future episode of Dirt Daily. But I think we now have the Jeep at a point where we could put it on the ground and roll it around. This drive shaft, what I'm most likely gonna do is put some tape around it so the U-joint caps don't fall off and then wire it up out of the way so that the thing will roll around. Um, these U-bolts, they seem to be okay, just kind of really dirty and crusty. So I'll probably soak them in something to get them cleaned up. And then we, We'll bring this thing back for a future episode where we look at transfer cases. So, we we're learning. Um, I think that's pretty successful. We got the Jeep to a point where we have fixed it enough that we can move it around and roll it in and out or roll it into the corner in the shop. But hopefully it doesn't get the same curse of a lot of my other flat fender projects that kind of get started but not finished. So, uh, I will be back with future episodes. If you guys like flat fender tech, let me know and I will keep doing more stuff. By the way, don't forget to sign up for Onyx Off-Road. They got that cool new app map on their app that's coming out. So use the 4 by fred discount code. You'll get a discount or wait for any of the major holidays. They also do discounts at like President's Day and maybe Groundhog Day. Arbor Day? I wonder if they do an Arbor Day discount. All right, that's it for this Dirt Daily. We'll see you guys next time. I like this Jeep. This thing's cool. Crusty, but cool. Kind of like me. Maybe not as cool, but more just as crusty. <laughs>